Ladies and gentlemen, this is a special video. Thank you for clicking on it. Today, I, your seventh favorite chess personality and 22nd favorite YouTuber, want to share with you one of the biggest accomplishments of my life, and that was the fact that yesterday I defeated my best uh, opponent, or I suppose the highest rated opponent, uh, in a chess.com uh, blitz game. Now, it wasn't like a three minute blitz game, no bonus time, you know, like 2, 2 a.m. because you can't sleep or on the toilet somewhere. No, this was Title Tuesday. And the reason that I played in Title Tuesday was because Magnus was playing. Yeah, Magnus was playing. That's going to be a separate video on its own. And I wanted to get a game against Magnus in the early stages when we still had the same amount of points, like one out of one. I didn't get to play against Magnus, but I did get to play against uh, Alexis Serrana. Now, you'll notice that this says 3035 but uh, somewhere on the bottom here, his rating is 3016. That's because when you, pull, uh, when you pull up the game, for some reason, it reflects your most recent rating. So this is his most recent rating, but when I played him, he was rated 3035. Uh, Alexei is one of the top juniors in the world, very, very strong player, and you can argue that Blitz Chess is meaningless, but it's kind of meaningful to me to beat strong players because, you know, I'm kind of garbage, so it's sort of nice to, uh, to win some games. Um, so I started the game with D4. Uh, he played Knight F6. And I played the Trumpowski. I actually think the only other time I've beaten him, and yes, there actually is another time, which is pretty wild. Uh, he played d5, and also it was a Trumpowski. Um, I played knight d2. There's a couple of ways to handle this. Obviously, you can you can go for these lines with bishop takes f6. Uh, it's been proven that black is fine with either recapture. Uh, so I actually don't do this. Uh, when they play d5, I actually play knight d2. And I try to play for e3, c3. I try to play for the little pawn pyramid, which normally you see in the London system with the bishop on f4, uh, but you can also see here as well. So c5 played. Uh, there's also dc5 here to take on c5 uh, rather than building up the pyramid. And then when black is busy recapturing the pawn, you can either even hang on to it if you follow engine lines like this. Uh, but of course, black is always okay here. Uh, or you could, uh, you, you know, you could play for e4. So you can play more in the center. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's there's a handful of options here. Uh, I played e3, and I went for my pawn pyramid. And yeah, I mean, here again, a position is completely equal, but black has many choices, like developing the bishop, or fianchettoing the bishop this way, or playing e6, or even taking on d4. Like, I've had people do this against me, and now it's basically a Karl Khan. Yeah, you're probably like, what are you talking about? Well, e4, c6, d4, d5. It's good to know your pawn structures. Um, so queen b6 is what he played in the game, attacking my pawn on b2. And here I went for this queen b3 approach. The first time I ever saw something like this, I took, and I, like, it was an over the board game. I was playing like an international master or something out of it. I was like a kid. And I, and I took and I was like, ha ha, I gave the international master doubled pawns. You know, these pawns are doubled. Then I got destroyed. Because the A-file is open, actually, it's known in, in, in especially in queenside uh, exchanges of the queens, taking like this, you gotta be really sure that opening that rook isn't gonna get you in any trouble. Um, so, uh, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's what I did. Now, he, he didn't take my queen. He played c4, and I played queen c2. Now, you might be wondering, Levy, why would you do that? Like, if you weren't gonna take him, because you know he's gonna open his rook, what is the, like, why didn't you just go queen c2 here? There's actually a pretty big difference. Uh, the difference is the fact that once this pawn commits the c4, he locks his own queen side, and immediately I'm looking at the move e4. So this is, the, this is pawn play at its finest. When the pawn is on c5, it's actually effectively preventing my pawn from ever moving forward. Why? Well, because d4 gets destabilized, and then I'm just going to lose the d4 pawn. So when the pawn is on c5, it prevents my e-pawn from moving because it's constantly having to reinforce my center. But when this happens, now the move e4 becomes really potent and really powerful because I'm going to get the c4 pawn. And what he plays in the game, for example, like let's say you play e6, well, then I can always even play b3. So committing the pawns here is not always so good for black because he plays directly into my hands and I, and I, and I kind of start chopping away, chipping away, chopping away, whatever you want to say. At his, uh, at his pawn play. So I was very happy to see c4. I, I, I dropped back, and I've had people who played this move to try to play bishop f5. Uh, after something like e4, black's position is like almost lost. Like very close. I mean, knight e4, knight c4 comes, it's real bad. So in the game, he played this. And the idea is quite obvious. Uh, the idea is either to exchange the bishop for something or wrap around. So if I... You know, if, if I, for some reason, play really slowly, his bishop gets to a great square. 
So that, that you know, he that, that's, that's why he played bishop g4 for the wraparound approach. Uh, now I know I have to go e4. The only question here for me is do I take the knight first or do I play e4 straight away? If I play e4 straight away, I kind of thought my bishop loses its purpose. But the engine doesn't think so. It thinks that e4 straight away is fine because the bishop can always drop back to this square. Okay, that's fair. Uh, what I did in the game is I, I, I took his knight first. And you say, Levy, you said on move two, you never take the knight. It's not the same. Move two is not move eight. I took the knight because now I can play e4 with no real concerns. And I'm threatening to just, just demolish the center. Like I'm going to take both pawns when he takes back. Like both of these things are going to be under attack. Um, and then in this position, he played e6, okay? Um, this exchange looks good in theory, because I'm like, oh, his pawns are so bad. But then I never make any progress on these pawns. So before I do that, uh, I decided to trade bishops with him. I would much rather he takes me and splits his center weaknesses than me take him and try to argue that these pawns are weak. I mean, sure, but how am I getting to them? Like, how will I get to those pawns? Oh, that's very easy, Levy. You just, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta do this. Yeah, sure. And then what if he just gives it away? And we already gave him, th we gave me three moves in a row. We gave me like four moves in a row. It doesn't matter because his bishops are so strong. Like the f6 pawn is not worth that much in the long run. So it's a big decision here of, um, of keeping the tension or not. And what I do is very simple. I, I don't want this bishop involved in the game and my bishop is never really going to have a bright future. So I trade it. Sometimes in chess, you have these moments where you can develop your own pieces with your opponent's help. You can basically force your opponent into helping you develop. Because if you play something like h5, that's great. Because now I trap his bishop. So he has to trade with me. He could play something like rook g8, but he still is going to help me develop because his rook is just going to be a target. Like he'll, it'll be, and, and I, he can't even do this because his rook just gets caught in the cookie jar and then king f1, right? And then I just win his rook. So I use his bishop to develop my own. I could have chased him away with my pawns, but again, I am trying to avoid and I'm actively thinking about that bishop standing on the g6 square. I don't want it laser beaming my pieces. So I trade bishops with him. And then he takes. And here I had a very difficult decision. I mean, if I asked you, which pawn do you take? Do you take this with the queen or the knight? Or do you take this with the knight? If you thought for like five seconds, one minute, I don't know, 30 minutes, how long you... How, I don't know how, how indecisive you are. Maybe some of you are so indecisive, like you don't know what to eat for dinner, you just starve. I, I don't know. Most of you, I think, would say knight takes c4. I mean, it's attacking the queen. It must be a good move. But as you get better in chess you're going to realize just because you can attack something doesn't mean it's a good move. A lot of us at the beginner level are like, what if they don't see it? And even if we get past that stage, we're like, what if they see it? It's okay. It's still a good move. No, it's not. Because now the queen slides over and the, the pace of the game changes. I'm no longer the one dictating. All right. I am being pushed around. So now I'm going to have to retreat out of a threat. Then he's going to reinforce his center with this I don't even know what this would do. This, this zigzag pawn structure. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing, I'm not happy here. So actually taking on c4, believe it or not, is the wrong move. I take on e4. Why? Because I attack a true weakness. And the difference here is that we have more stability in the center of the board. And I can always come back and pick this pawn up anyway. I have no weaknesses. No weaknesses at all. He plays bishop e7. And here I have an option to come back and immediately attack this pawn. I just choose to castle. Now, I didn't castle short because I actually expected he would castle long because he's not going to go this way. His king's wide open, right? So I figured if, if he's going to castle this way, I can go b3. And of course, I'm going to love this. I mean, I'm going to get the open rook. I have a great attacking opportunity here. That's why I castled short and let him make a move here. And he played h5. h5 is a is sort of kind of like a like a absent-minded uh, warning sign. Like, oh, I'm just going to attack you just in case you're not aware of what's going on over here. And when he played h5, uh, I was like, okay, um, but there's no immediate danger. And even if I let the pawn go all the way to h3, what if just this? I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I couldn't really... And, and again, we're talking situations where you give your opponents three moves in a row. I, so I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't super scared. It's, it's not like mate is just going to come. I mean, he's not going to get seven moves in a row in a game. That would be really not fair. But he played h5. 
And I had a couple of different ways of, of going after this pawn. I can drop my knight back or go queen a4. And I really liked queen a4. Uh, because as far as I could see, he can't guard his pawn unless he makes massive concessions. And those massive concessions come in the form of damaging his pawns, like beyond repair. I mean, the, the totally dead C pawn, the doubled A pawns, he's already got doubled F pawns, he's got this flank pawn doing God knows what, right? And I thought that was what he had to do, or he had to really go in for this poison pawn. The B2 pawn and the G2 pawn, but mostly the B2 pawn and the B7 pawn, the pawn on the, on the, on the B file, is the poison pawn, because if the rook for the opponent can slide over, like, this is just bad news. I mean, you're, you're just really causing yourself problems that you should not cause. He did take on b2, and I didn't play rook b1 because I was like, he could take my knight. And it's like, why would I go... I mean, I, I, can't, I can't go here because he takes my knight and guards this. So that's... Why would I do that? Well, as always, here comes Stockfish being the smartest kid in the classroom who nobody likes and says that I absolutely could have played this because here I can go here. I can make one extra move... And he can't do anything. Like, after this, rook b7. And it looks like I can maybe defend myself. Like, I mean, he can maybe defend himself. No. Rook takes bishop. That's just not a move that I even, like... Uh, I mean, I, I just kind of was like, oh, I, I can't play rook b1. Maybe if I was playing a weaker player. But for some reason, against the stronger player with kind of, like, nerves and everything, I was like, I'm just going to take on c4, which is the second best move. Uh, rook b1, though, is very good. Now, he doesn't have to go here. He could trade queens with me. Uh, if we trade queens, then I have this amazing deflection move. This bishop is what we call overloaded. So it's hitting this and this. So I have this. He can't take because the queen would hang. Then I take the queen. And then I take the pawn. So I'm just a pawn up with very good activity, and I'm winning. So he took on b2. I could have played rook b1. But I'm garbage, so I played queen takes c4, which is the second best move. Uh, he goes back, I play rook b1 now, and now he offers this queen trade. It, had he gone backwards, folks, uh, there is one move that you must consider in this position, and only one move. Um, if it, you can pause here. It's not a tactic, it's nothing winning on the spot, but just from an understanding chess standpoint. I know that's asking for a lot. What is the best move here? I'm going to give you a hint. This king is still in the middle, so we should do what? Ah, you know what I've um, really uh, gotten into recently? Oat milk lattes. You see, when I first heard about oat milk, it was marketed to me as this kind of like edgy alternative to milk. You know how like now it feels like we can milk anything? Some comedian said that, I don't remember his name. Um, and I was like, ah, oat milk. And then I tried it, it's delicious. It's absolutely delicious. If I could get an oat milk sponsor, I'd be super happy. Um, so the king is stuck in the middle. Uh, so we have to go d5. When, when you're kind of ready to go, all your pieces look locked and loaded, what's that next step? How do you take the game to the next level? Crack open the center. Because this is just real bad. I mean, now he can't really go either direction. Yes, he can play moves like rook d8, but you use the open center to transfer your pieces to attacking spots. Your knights will come in. Your rook will get involved. Black's just in shambles. And when everything clears off, these pawns are some of the most useless endgame pawns imaginable, right? Because at the end of the day, you have, to, you have to plan for all three phases of the game. Maybe not at low elo, but in kind of meta, you have to plan for all three stages of the game. So uh, that's why he traded queens with me, right? I, I said he does have the option to play queen c7, uh, but then that's when we have to go d5. So I'm trying to intertwine the game with more instructive moments. Does that make sense? Fantastic. So he plays queen a6, I trade, and now I'm petrified because like I know I'm winning, but what, what now? So I bring my rook down to the 7th rank. Why not? You know, he's ready to harass. Rook c7, maybe double up. Uh, he long castles, which is a pretty savage move. You can castle through a rook attack. You cannot castle through check. But in this case, there's no check. Right now, my rook's hanging. So I reinforce. And he plays rook d7, and I don't trade rooks. I cannot stress this enough. I have an advantage. I should not be liquidating. I don't have a material advantage. I have a positional advantage because I have the control of the b-file. He has very bad a-pawns. His, his pawn play really is what's killing him here. Um, and long-term weaknesses. So he kicks my knight out, and I'm ready to kind of go back to, to this way. That's exactly what I do. I go to c4, uh, and he moves his bishop out of the way of capture. Here I touch his a-pawn. I play rook a3, and the idea there is that once this pawn moves, 
suddenly I get access to another square and from that square I get access to that square and that is what got me really excited I played Rook B5 so very nice idea here from your uh, 22nd favorite youtuber or whatever I called myself Rook A3 forces the pawn up and allows my other rook to go take advantage of that newly freed up square. And on the next move, I'm gonna play rook c5. So super, super nice idea. He plays rook h6. He is defending to his credit. Now here I begin to miss uh, some pretty funny tactics because I'm so nervous. Uh, first of all, I can take this pawn. Like it's not something you consider because you have a rook defending something that's less valuable, but both of these pieces are pinned to the king. <laughs> Uh, so technically whatever he takes with I win a pawn. It doesn't matter what he takes with. Uh, he could take with a knight I still win the same pawn. It's kind of funny. Uh, I don't I miss that I just you know, I'm too nervous So I play d5 and the funny thing is it this looks like it's winning for me So I get very excited. You know, he's gonna move his knight d6 boom But the crazy thing is uh, d5 has no threat Why because I can't move this pawn because this is mate so even like in, in, all, in, in all these games, there's twists and turns and it's like, is my rook trapped? So he plays bishop b6 and I freak out a little bit. I'm like, oh my gosh. But then I realize I have rook b5 and I also have, again, I can't go here. Uh, again, I, I just said this, I can't do this because I get mated, literally the game ends. It's not even that I'm, you know, losing end game. I just, the game just ends on the spot. So the move d5, I thought was really good. It's an okay move. Uh, he has a savage move here, king d8, which no human being would play king d8 here. Um, not even, I don't even think Hikaru or Magnus play king d8 in a blitz game. It's much more natural to move the knight uh, and probably just sacrifice the exchange. Just go for this. Uh, but uh, he goes here and I kind of back up and then I shove my pawn forward once again. Now, I anticipated that he would sacrifice the rook here. I really thought that we would get this endgame where I have a rook for a bishop and a pawn, but we still have to play chess. I'm still almost getting mated. Uh, but he didn't do that. And so what I did here after I brought my rook back from the A-file uh, is I, I decided to consolidate. Uh, he did not take my pawn. So I said, you know what? You will now never be able to take my pawn. This pawn will permanently cut the circulation of your position. However, I missed a move here, which I ended up playing on the next move. The computer wanted me to play it now, but, you know, I got five seconds on the clock. I'm freaking out. I'm about to beat a 3,000. So I'm just trying to not make sure I don't make any mistakes. I don't leave any loose ends, although I'm pretty sure that's, that's a term they use in mafia movies when they, like, execute people. But anyway, I didn't want to leave any loose ends. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just I really wanted to defend my pawn. And um, the, the, the question is, if I asked you folks now, how does white... Take everything that's existing in this position and lay the smack down. You have everything, but you can't break through with what you have right now. You cannot break through with these four pieces. Who do you need right now? There's one move in this position. There's one thing missing. Technically, you can argue one, two, three, four. You got four pieces of Exodia. What's the fifth one? Huh? No, no, not a Yu-Gi-Oh fan. All right, no problem. Knight G3. This is it. The point is I'm at least winning this pawn but I actually want to go this way. I could have also gone to c1. So I could have gone c1, d3, c5. Oh, that, that would have been no, c5. Uh, if he plays rook f6, I'm just going to take this, come back for more, and then keep moving, and I just get a pass pawn. Uh, but he plays f4, and now I've joined the... That's it. I've joined the party. I'm going to c5 with the pin here. So he sidesteps to the a file. And uh, well, again, I don't have a lot of time here. So I play the move rook b5. And now my pawn is ultra well defended. This pawn is a thorn. I mean, it's cutting the circulation of the rooks from the rest of the position. And um, I'm threatening knight b6. He moves his knight to a5, uh, which I, doesn't really stop knight b6. But again, he doesn't have a whole lot of time anyway. And what's funny is here I miss maiden 2. <laughs> I miss knight c5. It's mate. He can't escape. And then I do it this way. And this is checkmate. Instead, I do it this way. So I take his knight, and then he takes and I mate him. And you said, what? That's also made in two. Well, technically not. Technically, my move is not the best move because when I go here, he has this. So he, he doesn't have to let me mate him. But I played rook takes a5. And I think to be a good sport, he allowed this mate. Uh, this is a beautiful mate. I mean, the king is locked away on the side of the board by the horses, and also to boot, it's a triple fork. 
So the knight that just got involved ends up putting the final blow in the game. What's pretty wild is that uh, up until a few moments ago, up until the move knight g3, that knight had only moved once. So I had played 30 mon moves, and this knight only moved one time in the opening. And then it gallops in triumphantly and delivers the, the kiss of death to the black king. Uh, and that's how we won the game. And um, yeah, I mean, just super exciting. Uh, it, it, it's very nice for me to get wins like this. Because, uh, you know, as much trash as I talk in my, in my Twitch streams when I'm playing Blitz and whatever, uh, the truth is if you know me, if you get to know me and you get to know my content, uh, you, you actually know that uh, I'm, I, am, uh, I, 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 I really know my limitations <laughs> as a human and as a chess player. Uh, I, talk, uh, I talk very openly and honestly about uh, self-assessment of my own abilities. Um, but you know, people see clips out of context or that, you know, they, 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 some folks don't like the way I talk. So they think I'm arrogant. It's like, couldn't be, uh, further from the truth actually. So when I'm playing guys like this, I'm like pretty nervous. I'm pretty terrified, you know, that I'm going to mess something up. And it's so nice to just finish a game from start to, to the conclusion without any slip ups. Uh, and the game right after this, I was in a completely equal, uh, time scramble against the 2850 GM and then I threw it away immediately because I got nervous. So, luckily I used my abilities on this game. Uh, yeah. Hope you enjoyed the video. And I'll do a full episode of Magnus playing Title Tuesday soon. Get out of here.